Please welcome your Master of Ceremonies, Mr. Miles O'Brien. for you. Now, I know I know you're upset about this shuttle thing, but I come from Washington. You know I'm on the NAC, the NASA Advisory Council. By the power vested in me, I present to you a space shuttle. <laughs> I should tell you, I'm gonna, I've got my uh, Twitter feed open. At Miles O'Brien is my address on Twitter. And if you want to chime in with a question or a comment as we talk here, I'm going to guess this crowd has a lot of portable mobile devices. Safe to say? All very well secured, I'm sure, as well, too. So let's talk about uh, how things are going. You have 455 people on the wait list, maybe 456 or 7 today, who knows, uh, who have put down some money for this. How soon before they get to fly? I know you and your family had planned a, a Christmas 2012 vacation to space. Is that going to happen? I, th I think so. I think we'll be um, finished and ready for next Christmas. And um, my kids have reached an age where they, where they love to experience some of the adventures that I do to, uh, together. So I'm very, very lucky as a father to be able to share, share these kinds of um, wonder wonderful things with um, Holly and Sam. Um, and then the following year, uh, we should take more people to space uh, in that one year on a you know, commercial spaceship company than NASA and the Russians have taken to space in the last 70 years. So, um, which well, is, which I, I know, I know you know the number, but we should tell the crowd here that basically in the entire history of the space age, about 50 years or so, only about 500 people have gone to space. Yeah. And your wait list is about that length, right? Yeah, I mean, by the end of this year, it will be 500. You uh, young men and women like a good challenge, it's obvious. I'm here to give you one more. Actually, this is a mandate. I have no authority to give it, but it's a mandate. And here it goes. You are the best and brightest. You will be leaders in your fields. You will solve, we hope, the world's myriad of problems. I believe you have a moral obligation to reach out, to educate, to inform, and inspire the rest of us. Now, I know this is not easy. You know, just because you can find a new species of sea slug, or learn how stars form, or understand how ground beetles relate to ecosystems, or find a way to test water potability with a phone, there is an app for that, just because you can do all these things and more does not mean you're necessarily inclined or have the talent, or for that matter, the desire to translate the intricacies of what you do into something non-scientists can relate to, much less gush over. But I submit that all of you must try, and some of you will find you will be good at it. You know, I would say probably the highlight of my time, really the highlight of my career, was this day. This is October of 1998, October 28th, uh, the late, great Walter Cronkite. I had the good fortune uh, to be his co-anchor. I think I'm probably the only person on the planet who can say I had Walter Cronkite as my co-anchor. That was a highlight. A low light in a, in a profound way for me was, of course, this day, February 1st of 2003, the loss of Columbia and her crew. There, there was a personal piece of this, which I should tell you about. I was, of course, had been covering the shuttle missions for quite some time and own an airplane and fly the airplane. And I had convinced NASA to let me become the first Western journalist in space, the first one to fly on the shuttle. I was all set to go be on the space station. We had a deal. We were going to announce it about two weeks after what should have been the landing, the safe landing of Columbia. And of course, that all um, was over in that moment. Why don't we just give the kind of coverage that they used to give back in the, the Mercury days? We'll do five, six hours. We'll do it absolutely soup to nuts. And we'll, um, uh, we'll, we'll give people who are really care about this exactly what they want. You know, the honest to goodness truth is, when I was sent by CNN to cover a space shuttle launch, I was there in case it blew up. And they, they sent me there, and they would put me on for two minutes, just to SRB SEP. 
And, and they would put me there for that two minute period of time. You can't tell anybody anything about what that mission is all about, who's on that mission, where they're going, why they're going. You're just there, frankly, on, on the eventuality, the possibility that it, that it could blow up. It's a terribly sad thing. And what that does is that, that pleases no one. Space, people really enjoy space, are not getting enough. And people who are not interested have no freaking clue what you're talking about. And so it, it, it turns out that, that the mainstream media is missing opportunities there, but that because of the distribution system and the way the distribution is all flattened out, it doesn't matter so much. Bottom line is, I don't, I don't need no stinking network. I don't need no stinking truck. I called up my buddies at Space Flight Now because <laughs> as much as anything, I didn't want to miss a shuttle launch after I left, left CNN, so I had to come up with some way to get a media pass. And um, I, said, I called them up and I said, how hard would it be given all that I have seen and how the, uh, you know, basically now a tiny little camera and you plug it into the Mac and you have a T1 line and you're, you're, you're on the web. Brian, first, could you explain string theory to yes, us? Yes, please. String Thank theory. you. Yeah. All right. Uh, Jerry, could you tell us some good jokes from the airplane movies? Um, yeah, sure. Don't, yeah. But don't call me Shirley. <laughs> well, what's the vector, Victor? <laughs> and uh, Tyler, can you explain why my son is immersed more in Halo than history? Uh, it, it's just not interesting enough for him. There you go. There you have it. I, I think we've summed up most of the world's problems here. Uh, I do. I, actually, I do want to talk with Brian. I, I made fun of uh, string theory, but uh, as we all do. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he had the courage to put this in a book and on television. So give him a round of applause for that, because <laughs> and Paula Apsell, who's in the audience, for supporting all that as well. Let's um, let's talk about whether science has reached a point where it's. Yeah, I mean, let's face it, we can't even work on our cars anymore. Uh, are we at a point where it's, it, it becomes so complex that it's off-putting and that's why it's hard to get kids engaged? Well, I don't think it's, it's that we've gotten to that point recently. I think for a long time, science has been framed in a language that many of us don't speak, which is mathematics. It goes back to Newton. So if you're not able to follow the language, it's very hard to immerse yourself in the subject, which makes it hard to get excited. But what we need to do is build bridges from the language of science to the more ordinary language of everyday concerns. And that is something that many of us in this room try to do. But when it's string theory, it's hard, isn't it? You know, string theory is easier uh, in some ways um, yeah. than, yeah. <laughs> as, You got as some Jerry string theory you. jokes there, yeah. Jerry? Come on, you got a few, right? No, I, I agree. Brian and I talk about that all the time. We do. <laughs> it's pretty simple stuff. I, I know there's a lot of bruised feelings about the, the space shuttle and where it ends up and what museums it goes into. But I just want to say, when I think of this room and when I think of Houston, I don't think about museums and I don't think about relics and I don't think about docents. I think about doers. And to the extent that we bog ourselves down in a debate over where the relics go, I think we take our eye off the ball. The people in this room are all about smoke and fire and speed and exploration. And let's stay focused on that as our goal. The final frontier is our goal in this room, not where we pickle and chalk these old crafts, all right? So let's stay on that. Generations, you know, listening to that talk that David Hartman moderated and listening to them talk about how business aviation was vilified uh, makes me a little bit angry. Um, you know, a lot of people in this country complain that we don't make anything. We don't lead the world in things anymore. Well, this is one place that we do lead. And do we want to squander that lead? Because surely there are other countries waiting to take our place. You know, Mars is my second favorite planet. And many of you in this room make me feel as if I've been there. How cool is that? Thanks for the outstanding, vicarious, thrill ride these past 40 plus years, especially these past five. Sometimes I think we take for granted uh, how amazing it is, how awash we are in these wonderful images, these high resolution, panoramic, microscopic, three-dimensional images shot on the surface or in orbit. What we found is a place that uh, looks an awful lot like home, if you're from New Mexico, I guess. And I think that's part of the appeal. You know, you look at Eagle Crater, and a human being can imagine being there in hiking boots. Uh, it's truly a transformative experience. And when you consider all the proof we have now amassed here, or you have now amassed here, that this place was once warm and wet, you can't help but look at those pictures and think about our place in the universe and wonder 
and how close we are to learning if we actually do have some company. How great is it to be alive at this time when we just might learn the answer to that question? So now we're in a world where one network reports with a straight face about a study that suggests staring at breasts, a woman's breast presumably, is good for a man's heart. Now as we say in the newsroom, there are some stories too good to check out. <laughs> that was one of them. Alas, the study was bogus, much to the chagrin of many men in the newsroom. The result of this, frankly, is a hungry, abandoned audience out there. The Pew Research folks did a survey not too long ago, and the subject uh, that people are most interested, according to their poll, that they get the least of is, guess what? Science. No surprise, right? Now, I could go on and on here about the terrible state of the media and how we might fix that, but I'm aware that the longer I talk, the more you kids have to wait for the announcement. Did I tell you about my childhood? According to the Pointer Institute, the industry lost $1.6 billion in annual reporting and editing capacity, that means people, since 2000. 30% collectively of the newsrooms are gone. So just try to find a science and technology correspondent at a newspaper, major newspaper today, uh, subjects you all care about. It's like find, trying to find an engineer at a poetry reading, right? It ain't going to happen. Um, well, maybe there's a few of you, I don't know. but. This is the evening news. You know, this used to be the gold standard, ABC, CBS, NBC, evening news. Obviously, that is no longer the place. There's still a lot of people out there, but you have to ask yourself, is that the most effective way to reach people, or is it better to narrow cast to those 300,000 people who are just absolutely gripped and interested in that space coverage you're doing? Just a couple of cartoons I want to leave you with. Uh, actually, he says there, I work for the newspaper, but people will talk, won't talk to me without it, referring to the camera. Uh, and then this one across the um, kitchen table, we need to start seeing other news sources. And finally, this one, the best of times, the worst of times. The truth is, folks, the barbarians are not just at the gate, they're inside the palace grounds. And right now, I kind of like being a barbarian. Thanks very much.